Hello, hello, hello everyone. Dr. Stephanie Shuttler here and today I have a fun video for you. We are talking about something that I love to talk about, something that people love to talk about or love to talk to me about. It goes both ways and that is coyotes. And these animals are so misunderstood. So I am here, I'm a scientist, I'm a wildlife biologist. I am gonna clear up some misconceptions about coyotes. You'll learn some fun stuff. I I was able to conduct some research on them, so we'll go over all of that today. My channel is all about empowering scientists and inspiring you to conserve the natural world. So let's go ahead and get started on this episode. You'll notice I have my microphone out. This means I am also recording to my podcast. So if you like listening, um, when you're doing, when, <laughs> when you're like walking your dogs like I do or driving your car, you can go find the Fancy Scientist podcast and listen there too. Okay, so first, let's get started with what's the deal with coyotes. And when I say what's the deal, I mean that people have been talking about coyotes a lot more recently. And why is that? Um, so I, this is not going to be as much like coyote fun facts. It's more about living with coyotes and clearing up some of the misconceptions that we have, or the people have, I don't have them, about coyotes. So one of the big reasons why coyotes are talked about a lot is because traditionally coyotes are a Western species. So here in North America and the United States, coyotes are found in the Western portion of the continent. But what's happened over the past few decades is that coyotes have expanded their range. So they have moved basically in all directions. They have moved definitely eastward, which is um, why we see coyotes here in North Carolina. So I live in Raleigh, North Carolina. Coyotes historically have never been here, but within the past 30 years, they have expanded their range. So now we have coyotes all over the United States. And even here in North Carolina, I've mentioned a couple of times before, that we did this, this statewide citizen science camera trapping project. So we have these, these camera traps, they are triggered by heat and motion. And whenever a critter walks by, um, or a warm-blooded critter walks by, I should say, that's bigger than about a chipmunk, these cameras get triggered and they take a series of pictures of that animal. So even here in North Carolina, we have the Outer Banks, which is a series of islands, and we have camera traps up on the Outer Banks, and we got coyotes playing in the sand on the beach. Well, I shouldn't say directly on the beach, but we had them in some, some sandy areas, so we didn't have the camera traps like set up on the ocean waves, and the coyotes weren't like you know, swimming along in the ocean. No, they were, but they were in a sandy area and it was fun to see, that, see it that way. They have also expanded their range considerably south and my former boss, Dr. Roland Kays, and um, one of our graduate students, Allison Hody, they were doing a project on coyotes in, um, in Panama, which is which is where they were, which is the most southern portion of their range, and they call this project Canid Collision because um, of the coyotes and the um, crab-eating foxes. Like they were going to meet in Panama, and what was going to happen? So you can go to emammal.org and see photos of this gained collision project or photos from it and the cool thing about these photos is that the coyotes look very dog-like and 
that's likely because, or it is because they're at the edge of their range. So there's not as many coyotes around. So coyotes, when they have the choice to breed, they are going to choose to breed with coyote, which is their species. But if there's no other coyotes around, they will essentially breed with the next best thing, which is a dog. So if you look at um, emammal.org and search for canid collision, you'll see some really interesting photos of coyotes that look like dogs. We will definitely talk about, actually, we'll talk about it now. Um, so one of the misconceptions about coyotes here in the East is that there are koi wolves. So, and also koi dogs too. And these guys are like some, people think they're like, like bigger than coyotes and, um, the way that people talk about them, it always, it almost feels like they're like a kind of like a super animal. But this is a misconception. And my boss, Roland Kays, um, in addition to the Canon Collision, he um, has studied coyotes a lot and he wrote an article for um, the conversation on this. And it's called, There's No Such Thing as a Koi Wolf. But basically, um, Yes, you can have hybrid animals between coyotes, wolves, and dogs, but they are not really hybridizing in the wild. So all of the species pretty much have all of each other's genes in them, but they are mostly that species. So coyotes will be mostly coyotes, but they'll have some dog genes in them, some wolf genes in them. Um, I guess do dogs won't have wolf genes in them or coyote genes in them, but that wolves will have the same thing too. So they're mostly those species. So we're not really having those like like half coyote, half wolf hybrids. That that is a myth. That's a we're busting myths here. That is a misconception. So I'll link to that paper in the show notes. And one of the reasons why coyotes, um, actually maybe I should add something in there before we get to that. So here in North Carolina, we do have red wolves and they have been reintroduced to the eastern part of the state. They are, some consider them a critically endangered species, some consider them an experimental species, but um, regardless, there's very few wild red wolves. So these guys are, there's only like 40 of them, and they are, um, they have been captive bred and re-released into the wild. And they are different than the gray wolf, different than coyotes, but some scientists have, some scientists have had debate whether they should be a real species or not, if they are, um, really just ancestral wolf coyote hybrids. So that is a whole other um, podcast topic. But hybridization in that area actually is a real threat for the red wolves there because if there aren't enough red wolves and when you have 40 individuals, you don't really have that many individuals. So when there aren't enough red wolves, they're gonna go again for the next spec best thing, which is coyotes. So one of the big conservation challenges of working with red wolves is actually that they hybridize with coyotes a lot. And when this happens, um, this is really sad. So a lot of the, or I think all of them are tracked by collars um, and scientists know when they're having pups, but if they have hybrid pups, they have to go in there and euthanize them because it's diluting more of the red wolf genes. So this is an area where you may have hybrids, but again, this is a really small area in North Carolina. So the whole idea of an Eastern koi wolf, usually when people are talking about it, I, I usually think they're referring more to the Northeast, um, Northeastern United States. So this is, um, even if we do have a couple hybrids, it's not like we have this whole like new subspecies of koi wolves that is not a thing. Okay, so one of the reasons why coyotes have been so successful at expanding their range is because last time I had talked about 
we, um, or I talked about that we had lost our apex predators here in the eastern United States. So we lost gray wolves, we lost mountain lions. So with this removal of this top predator, it's been easy, easier for coyotes to move in. Now, gray wolves and mountain lions, they don't really prey upon coyotes. Like they're, That's not like their main prey base. They're not going to want to eat them, but they will kill them um, for competition reasons. And just in general, the competition makes it harder for a coyote to survive with this, those apex predators around, especially gray wolves, which are obviously more similar to them given that they're canids compared to mountain lions. So that's one of the reasons why they've been able to expand, but also they're just such amazing generalists. Um, and actually, and historically, coyotes are a more of a prairie species, so they were, you know, around the the Great Plains a lot. But um, prairie land got transitioned into agriculture, which is also open. And with development here in the east, urban development, um, it's also more open. So there's these little edge habitats, and coyotes have been really good. At adapting to these these types of habitat and um, just adapting to the different environments so they are um, like I said they're generalists so um, yes they are carnivores and they eat meat but they can also eat a lot of um, vegetative products specifically fruits um, they're they're more vegetarians than you than you might think or they eat more vegetation than you might think but they're just, they, they have a wide prey base and they can adapt. So one of the other things about coyotes that I wanted to talk about in, in terms of like what's the deal with coyotes or one of the reasons why we are hearing so much about coyotes nowadays is because of this amazing ability of them to adapt to urbanization. That is why people have been seeing them, and we'll talk a little bit about this, but some coyotes have some bizarre behavior. So coyotes have really adapted to the most um, populous cities here in the United States. Coyotes live in Chicago, in LA, in New York City, in Central Park in New York City. And um, there is a scientist, Stan Garrett, who studies the coyotes in Chicago. And when I talk about coyotes living in Chicago, so um, before I talked about mountain lions living in LA, and yes, mountain lions do live in LA, but it's more like the green areas outside of LA. You're not gonna find a mountain lion really in downtown central LA. Coyotes though are different. When I went to this urban wildlife conference in Chicago, Stan picked us up from the airport and as we were driving, he was showing me where the different packs hang out because he has them all colored with transmitters so they can follow him. And one of them was using I-90, which is a major interstate here in the United States, as a corridor. So these guys, even I was shocked. I'm a, I'm a wildlife biologist and I was shocked at how urban these coyotes are living. So they're really downtown Chicago. And this is, um, I just think this is amazing. I think it is so cool that um, these animals have been able to adapt to such urban environments. And by far, most of the time, they don't get noticed. Now, there are some experience or some cases where they do get noticed, and this is again, what's the deal with coyotes? But there's cases of, um, in LA, people will see coyotes frequently. Um, again, I don't think as much Chicago, but there is um, this story of a coyote going into a Quiznos and it wasn't rabid, it just like walked into a Quiznos and then I think it sat in the the cool um, drink area. Um, so yeah, that was a very bold coyote. Um, and um, another story about a coyote in 
Portland in Portland, Oregon, riding the subway, like actually getting on the subway and riding it. So um, these are some pretty crazy coyote stories. And coyotes, like I said, they've adapted to urban situations, urban environments, but they've also become bolder. And this is something that I'm studying in my research to look at the boldness levels of not only coyotes, but all the animals we get on camera traps and see if, if in urban areas, or in, in our case, suburban areas here in North Carolina, if these animals are bolder. So I actually had a, a test an experiment where I would put out a flamingo, which is like a, it's a foreign object that, that, um, that animals don't normally come across people. Most people don't have fl lawn flamingos. And I did it before and after with camera traps. I had two sets of camera traps, one camera trap, I put a flamingo out and the other one I didn't. And I, um, collected all these data across suburban areas, um, rural areas, exurban areas, to look at the differences between um, their behaviors in approaching the flamingo. So if they're more bold in urban areas, we would expect them to approach the flamingo more quickly, to investigate it, um, to touch it. And we did get some really cool pictures on these camera traps and um, a couple of coyotes even biting the plastic lawn flamingo. I haven't analyzed the data yet, um, so I'm still looking forward to doing that, but um, it was just like a really fun study and um, hopefully we'll get some cool results out of that. Let's talk about some more coyote misconceptions or I will um, verify them or, or not. We'll, we'll go through some of the most common ones. And these really have to do a lot with why people dislike coyotes. So here are the, the main reasons why I thought, what I thought up of, um, or that, <laughs> okay, you can delete this whole thing. Let's delete this one. Because coyotes have become more urban and more suburban, people are seeing them more. And I think this is a big reason to, that contributes to why people don't like them or hate them. So coyotes are blamed for a couple of things and I'll take you through each one of those and we can see how much truth there is to this. So the first one is killing cats, that coyotes kill cats. Second one is a lot of people blame coyotes for killing deer and for um, deer declines um, here in the, and this is mostly in the Eastern United States or from, to my knowledge, only in the Eastern United States. And this would be white-tailed deer. And then there's also some strange news stories that um, invoke fear in the people of coyotes. So there's some things, there's some stories about coyotes following people. Um, and again, we can get into that a little bit later. But first, let's talk about cats. Now this one is true. Coyotes do kill domestic cats. In fact, on our camera traps, we had camera traps, um, like I said, all over the state, all over the mid-Atlantic region, and we have several photos of coyotes with cats in their mouths. Now the cats could have been roadkill, to be fair, um, but it I mean, coyotes should be killing cats. I mean, it's, it doesn't, it's not unreasonable to believe that they um, kill cats. It's within their prey repertoire. Now, that being said, uh, now I'm a cat owner. I own four rescue cats. I love them to death, but I don't think we should blame coyotes for killing cats. I personally believe if you let your cat outdoors, that's a risk you face. And coyotes are just doing what they do. It's their natural instinct. There's, um, I just don't feel like there's anything that we can do about it. And the best thing that you can do for your cats is to keep them in, indoors. And that's not only for their safety, um, actually, that was the main driver why I kept all my cats indoors because I didn't want to come home to like a roadkill cat. But 
conservationists are really passionate about the subject, about keeping cats indoors because cats kill so much wildlife. So just like I was talking about the coyotes and it's their instinct to kill animals, it's also cats are predators too. Cats have instincts to kill. And with house cats, they're not even hungry. A lot of them, although my cats, even they're, one's, one's obese, she is, and the others are chubby. And man, they act like they are starving. I can't imagine if they were really starving because sometimes, sometimes they trick me. It's like, you know, 3 p.m. and they're like, begging for their dinner and I'm like no you guys are really good weights like you can even afford to lose some so I know you're not starving anyway I digress but um cats they kill for fun I know my cats would be super killers if I let them out and for a, um, a lot of these animals so um, it's usually small mammals they kill birds and um, small reptiles like lizards and it is particularly detrimental to birds um, because small mammals, um, they usually have um, pretty quick lifespans. They don't live, they don't live that long to begin with. Um, most species that live near people are common. So it's not as a big of a problem for small mammals, but it is a real big problem for birds. And cat cat killings, cat the cats killing the birds ha, is a is a major threat to um, to bird species that are threatened with um, extinction, that are, that they're endangered. So uh, if you have cats out there, please keep them indoors. If you do let them outside, you can buy them harnesses, which I know looks funny. Actually, my mom for our our cat at home, she would put the harness on the cat and when she tied the harness to a tree the cat Roxy she wiggled herself out of it so what my mom did is put the harness on with like the long leash and she didn't tie it up to anything and she would watch Roxy and there were instances when Roxy was getting close to like stalking something and trying to kill it and she always stopped it so that's that's an option if you do want to let your cat go outdoors so yeah so coyotes do kill cats Coyotes do kill small dogs too. Um, so people who have um, the, the, I mean, I don't know what kinds of dogs they are, but you know, the, the toy dogs, those little dogs, they should be really careful, especially letting their dogs outside at night. And you might not want to let them loose in a fenced area or even if your area is fenced, but instead take them on a leash and walk them. So, um, so it's at reduced risk. They do make these um, funny little coats with like spikes on them. I am not sure if they work or not, um, but you could try that too. But yes, coyotes do kill cats. Okay, now killing deer. This is um, a lot more complicated. Um, so as I mentioned in the last podcast, Coyotes don't really predate adult deer. That's, it's pretty difficult for them. And like I said, I scoured the literature for my, my study that I did, and I could not really find any evidence. There's just a couple of anecdotal stories um, of uh, coyotes killing adult deer. I think it was like maybe only one or two papers. But um, they do kill fawns. And then if you remember from my paper, my research paper as well that I talked about, we looked at deer vigilance, which is an indicator of fear. So the more vigilant deer are, that means the more they suspect predators in their environment. So if coyotes are, are, are a predator to adult deer, they're going to be more vigilant in areas with, with higher coyote abundance. And in our research, we did not find that. So that suggests that adult deer are not fearful of coyotes, at least in, in terms of reflected through vigilance. Perhaps there's other ways, but vigilance is a really great score of, of risk predation. Um, or sorry, <laughs> predators. predators. Um, so getting back to deer and coyotes, I guess we were talking about deer and coyotes, but going back to how coyotes might affect deer populations is through fawns. So coyotes definitely prey upon fawns. They definitely kill them. But the question is whether their killings are additive or compensatory. So what this means is that if you never had coyotes or never had a predator, and you have a deer population, 
there are going to be a certain percentage of fawns that do not make it, that die anyway. Um, so even without any predators, if you're in a limited environment, there's got not gonna be enough food always, or there's gonna be disease, so not all of them are going to make it. So the question is, is the presence of coyotes killing more deer than, um, than, than um, would not have survived normally. So are they, so, the, so fawns that are already dying, are they adding onto that? Are they creating more fawn deaths? Or are they killing fawns that would have died anyways? So the presence of coyotes doesn't really have any impact on the deer population. So this is really hard to study, and there are um, there's studies. It's, it's, okay, let me ask and add something else to it too that adds to deer deaths. Um, in the north, you have colder winters as well, so a fawn might not make it through the winter. But here in the southeast, it's less challenging. So there's been studies, but it's really hard to come to a definitive conclusion. It does seem like coyotes. They do prey upon fawn, and it does seem like they have more impact in some experiments they did with control areas, and um, so they removed coyotes, and they had um, coyotes add back in into these experimental enclosure plots, and they did find some differences in that the coyotes um, killed more fawns compared to the exclusion plots, but... The problem is that it is really, really, really hard to get rid of coyotes. Even in these exclusion plots, they had challenges with it. So I don't think any of them were 100% coyote proof because remember, I said coyotes are great adapters. Um, they, they adapt to the environment, they're really great generalists. So think about like what kind of fence you would have to have to keep coyotes out. You think they're dogs, so my dog can dig under a fence. So if a coyote really wants to get in there, um, it seems like they could find some ways to get in there. Then there are these stories of coyotes following people. So they are bolder, they are more curious. It seems to happen with people who have dogs more. I'm not sure if they're smaller dogs or not, but it would make sense to me more that they're smaller dogs, um, or the coyotes are attracted more to the smaller dogs because they that invokes more of their prey um, um, response or predator response. But there are cases where people report like going into a forest and coyotes following them. And what I, what I mean by following them is they're not like running after them and chasing them, but just being too curious, coming, coming too close. So in those situations, what I recommend you do, it's very similar to the mountain lion. You wanna make yourself look big. You're gonna to wanna to be loud. So things you can do are clap your hands. You can shake your keys, um, yell at the coyote, tell it to go away. You can throw rocks in its direction, throw sticks in its direction. Maybe it'll be like a dog and go fetch it. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> but again, you're gonna wanna be big and scary so the coyote will leave you alone. If coyotes do that, it's very unlikely that they are rabid. I think they're just being curious and um, I guess it could be the early stages of rabies. So if you're if it's in, if it's at your house or somewhere you live and you see this coyote constantly hanging out, then I would call your state agency, state wildlife agency, and and report it. But you will be able to tell rabid animals very much from non-rabid ones. So so the curious coyotes, they might approach you but they're not gonna be vicious or aggressive. And here in North Carolina, we had both stories reported where there was one of a coyote following a man and his dog in the woods. Um, and the coyote did keep his distance, but the man was concerned. And then there was another story of um, a rabid coyote and somebody took uh, phone footage of this video footage and man, you can really tell this coyote is rabid. It is 
extremely aggressive. It was even like trying to attack the car. So that's a, not a normal coyote at all. That is a very rabid and dangerous coyote. And in that case, you need to call the police or animal control, whoever can get out there and take care of the situation. Cases like these make people scared of coyotes, but quite honestly, you don't have to be. When I would set up my camera traps, um, especially with kids at, at the schools, um, they would actually get coyotes frequently at their camera traps. And they, um, the, a lot of these schools, most of the schools were suburban, so it wasn't like the most rural areas. And when I would set up the camera traps, the kids were like, aren't you scared? Like, what's what's the most, like, what's the scariest animal you see when you, when you set up camera traps? And so far my scariest incident is when I was setting up camera traps and I had to walk around this field and there was a big flock of Canada goose and they just wouldn't move. And it was like the only area I could walk through and they just like stared at me and wouldn't move and then they started to hiss at me and I was like yes they're they're the scariest animal but I've, I've never seen a, a wild coyote the only place I've seen one is Yellowstone National Park and Yellowstone is pretty special it's pretty these animals are used to tourists and people driving around in cars um so it's, it's more likely you're gonna see a coyote there. But I've never seen a coyote here in North Carolina. We get lots of gray foxes, lots of red foxes in our neighborhood. I've seen a gray fox downtown Raleigh, but I have not yet seen a coyote and I really wanna see one. So you don't need to be scared of coyotes. You don't need to be scared to go walking in the woods. Coyote attacks are very, very, very rare. It's amazing because so many people are scared of wild animals, but yet the animal that causes the most danger to us, at least here in the United States, is the domestic dog. You're much more likely to get bit by an aggressive dog than you are a wild animal. And here we love dogs. And in fact, we have like whole campaigns against certain breeds that are perceived as being more aggressive or more vicious. It's the same thing with coyotes. They're blamed for, for things that they don't really do. So, um, so yeah, you don't need to be scared of coyotes. And like I said, unless you really see one acting weirdly or acting aggressively, then you're gonna wanna call for help. But for the most part, you're lucky to see one. Like I said, I have never seen one. Now, even though I am telling you not to be scared of coyotes or, you know, it's just a part of life that they might kill your cat, people still hate them. And actually, a lot of hunters hate them. When I have posted about coyotes on my Instagram, I get a lot of backlash from hunters specifically, and they blame coyotes for the deer decline. And they argue that it is really important to control the coyote population by, of course, hunting them. Um, and not even hunting them, but just killing them. They have coyote killing contests across the United, well, at least here in the Eastern United States, they have coyote killing contests. And um, I don't even think there is any season or anything. I think, at least here in North Carolina, I think you can just kill them. I don't know if there's limits but um, people tend to think of them as a nuisance species. I guess another reason people might, might hate them too is because they are perceived to go after chickens as well. I don't think they're perceived to go, off, to go after livestock like, like gray wolves are, although maybe smaller species. But I do know people blame them for chickens and actually there was a chicken coop study that was done in our lab and I don't think coyotes were detected at all near chicken coops. We had camera traps near chicken coops and I don't believe there are any coyotes photographed near them. So, so people don't like them and they want to kill them but here's the thing. I don't care what your stance is on hunting. This is, this is not me coming from like a I don't wanna shoot animals, I don't wanna kill them because I think that's what a lot of people think. It's that it doesn't work. The research is showing it doesn't work. And um, like I said, my boss, he studies coyotes or my former boss, he studies coyotes and he did research on this. And he looked at the rates of coyote um, population growth in all these different states. And since they have entered the state, so remember I said they're 
They've been expanding into these states. They've never lived there before. So he's been looking at their population growth and the hunter um, numbers, because hunters have to report the number of animals they kill. And hunting is doing nothing to decrease these populations. They are just going like expon exponential. So it just, it just doesn't work. And like I said, from that other exclusion experiment, it's really hard to keep coyotes out. So once you start killing them, they just start coming back. And even the North Carolina Wildlife Resources um, Commission, in one of their email newsletters, they had um, a statement. I had, they had a report actually analyzing all of the different study is on coyotes and they came to the conclusion as well that killing is not an effective means to control them and that's an agency that they make their money from hunting so they're definitely not anti-hunting at all but it really looks like killing coyotes is ineffective for controlling their populations and actually scientists think that it could be even worse it could make the situation even worse so what we have going on is when coyotes are not disturbed, they form a monogamous pair. So you have a male and a female and they have young and they have territories. Now they're not as um, pack oriented as wolves are. Wolves will be in this pack full of their family members and they'll be in these big groups. Coyotes will be in these pairs and then some of the young may stay with them, but we don't see them in these large groups as compared to, to wolves. But when you have a male who is older and can secure a territory and therefore he's monitoring the territory, it's his, it's his home range, it's his area, he wants to keep other coyotes out because his mate is there and he wants to be the only one to mate with her. So he is the one who is chasing those coyotes out, making sure they don't come in. Also, if he is an established male, he is probably bigger, scarier to the coyotes um, and um, likely tougher, more aggressive compared to like some young coyote. So in that case, if you are a young coyote who is dispersing, trying to find your new area and you come across all these territories that are occupied by older males, it's gonna be harder for you to survive. And you, I mean, you're gonna to have to find your own new territory and who knows how far you have to go and if you're gonna be able to get enough food along the way. So it is much harder for these younger coyotes to survive. But in situations where you have a lot of killing going on, especially these killing contests, which are you know, quite literally killing as many coyotes as you can, you're constantly removing these older individuals from the landscape and it's kind of a free for all. So all of these coyotes are mating, they're all dispersing, there's not really strong established ter territories and therefore there's just my more coyotes all over the place because nobody is really, is really um, like guarding their territory and keeping others out. So essentially like all of the coyotes can go anywhere and there's just more coyotes everywhere. So again, killing coyotes does not, it is not an effective solution in terms of reducing their numbers. You might kill a lot of individuals, but they just bounce right back. And even in higher numbers, that's what the data looks like. It looks like the population keeps growing and growing and growing. So coyotes are here to stay here in the east. We cannot get rid of them, at least with any solutions that exist today. So we're gonna have to coexist with them. So I hope this, this podcast, um, this video, I'm recording this on YouTube as well for you podcast listeners. I hope this um, gave you some new insight into coyotes and gave you some tips for living alongside them. Um, but again, you don't have to be scared. It is extremely rare to even see a coyote, even though they are becoming more bold here in urban areas. So like any animal, just appreciate them and watch them from afar, unless they're really causing problems for you or you see signs of um, a disease like rabies. 
If you like this video, want to learn more about wildlife, more about conservation, subscribe to this YouTube channel. Also, you can check out my podcast, the Fancy Scientist podcast. I have lots of episodes on wildlife, also tips for wildlife biologists and scientists. I hope to see you there. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.